Last week we began a, a series where we're examining an occurrence in scripture, the book of Jonah. And the book of Jonah is a, is a story, but really it's an encounter. I don't like saying story because when we say story, people think make-believe. The encounter of Jonah is an occurrence in scripture that many kids learn about in kids' church or in Sunday school. Remember Sunday school? You remember Sunday school? Um, but it's an occurrence that actually happened. It, it seems unbelievable, but it really did happen. And as we're walking through the, the, the Old Testament book of Jonah, we get, begin to discover how God has relentless love for us. The story of Jonah is a story of God's relentless love. And many people question the story of Jonah. And I started last week with this. I'm going to start again and just help you understand. Maybe you question the events in the book of Jonah. Did it really happen? Well, Jesus taught that Jonah was the foremost Old Testament prophetic sign that he would spend three days and three nights in the grave followed by his resurrection. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus said, for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And then Jesus went on and taught about how Jonah preached repentance to the Ninevites and they repented. In verse 41, Jesus said, the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. So when you ask the question, did the story of Jonah, did the occurrence of Jonah actually happen? Jesus believed it did. So really, it's not a question of, do you believe the story of Jonah? It's a question of, do you believe the teaching of Jesus? Either Jesus is the son of God and everything he taught is the true word of God, or Jesus was a fanatical madman who taught lies, and he's not. He's the son of God. So right there in Matthew 12, Jesus teaches us about Jonah. And I told you, the story of Jonah is a story of the relentless love of God. God pursues us with his love. Like, you understand Today, can I help you understand? God loves you, period. Wherever you are in your walk with the Lord, he loves you. And he will pursue you with his love. And as you see in the story of Jonah, when we walk in rebellion, God doesn't stop loving us, but God continues to pursue us. Last week we saw in chapter one, verse one, it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Verse two, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. We spent some time last week unpacking chapter one. Here's what Jonah did. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and, the, and Jonah said, you got the wrong guy, Lord. He said, those people deserve your punishment. God, I know you're a God of mercy. God, I know you're a God of grace, but they don't deserve your mercy. Those people are mean and evil. And so Jonah went, in verse three, it says, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the ferry, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You remember last week I told you, if you want to live in rebellion and run from God, you can always find a boat going in the wrong direction. And Jonah went to the port of Joppa. He just happened to find a boat going in the other way. And Jonah ran 2,500 miles away from where God sent him to go. God spoke and gave Jonah clear direction. And Jonah did the exact opposite. And we say, well, I would never do that. But many of us, God has given clear direction. Are you following exactly what God asked you to do? Well, nobody's going to know if I don't do exactly what God asked me to do, but God will know. And God will pursue you with his relentless love. And the result of Jonah fleeing from the Lord, running away from God, living a life of rebellion, is discovered in the last verse of chapter 1. In verse 17, the scripture says, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. So as we continue the story of Jonah with chapter two, my title today is simply this, Remember God. Remember God. Verse 17 of chapter one says, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Many people get to verse, chapter one, verse 17, and say, oh, Jonah died but I don't believe Jonah died. Because you get to chapter two, verse one, and verse one tells us Jonah prayed. Look what it says. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. I don't believe Jonah died because dead people don't pray. Jonah was alive and well on the belly of a great fish. He said in verse two, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep, from the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Do you realize the magnitude and the power of what Jonah is saying? He called out to God. Jonah, in his rebellion, cried out to God and God answered him. 
I don't think we fully grasp the magnitude that we, we, can, we can cry out to God. We can pray and call on God, and God promises to answer. Now, have you ever thought about how amazing that is? The God, the one who spoke the world into existence, the creator, the sustainer of life, the one who is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, our redeemer, the holy one, Jehovah, the Lord God of all creation, the famous one, the sovereign mighty God of the universe is waiting for us to cry out to him. And he says, if you cry out to me, if you call on me, if you pray to me, I will answer. Y'all don't realize how cool that is. Y'all don't realize how amazing that is. We, we get overwhelmed with life, and we say, what am I going to do? And I don't know how it's going to work out, and I don't know what's going to happen. And God says, ask me. Oh, I don't really want to pray and bother God. God, as he tells us in his word, call out to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you deep and unsearchable things. Jonah, in the belly of a great fish, cried out to God. Now, now remember, in chapter one, Jonah basically said, forget you, God, I'm not going to Nineveh. He said, you got the wrong guy. In fact, I'm going to get as far away as I can because I refuse to do what you asked me to do. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And doing what he wanted to do led him to be in, in the belly of a great fish, and what do you do when you're in the belly of the great fish? You pray. God, uh, I, I might have been wrong. I might not should have got on this boat and headed for Tarshish. I might should have gone to Nineveh. Jonah prayed. He called out to God. Now think about this. When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you prayed and talked to God? See, we can go days without praying. And then things in our life get bad. Things in our life get difficult. But hold on, can I tell you something? Whether you pray or not, things are going to be difficult in your life. So we haven't prayed in days and things start falling apart. We go, well, I guess I should pray. Here's an idea. Pray first. Pray first. Here's an idea. Start every day. God, thank you for today. And I put today in your hands. And I ask you to lead God and direct me. Whatever may come today. God, at the end of the day, can I be singing that you are good? But most of us start our day, well, I got to get on Facebook and see what's going on. I got to get my Snapchat and my Be Real and my Instagram and all your social posts got to go. And you never stop and take a moment to say, God, what do you have planned for today? And we go through these days, and we go, oh, God, what happened? How am I going to make it to the end of the day? And God says, well, if you'd have asked me this morning, I would have told you this is what's going to happen. I would have led you. We, we forget the scripture says the steps of the righteous are ordered of God. If God's going to order my steps, maybe I should ask God what step to take next. Imagine how different would our life be how different would our decisions be? How, how different would our relationships be? Or how different would our finances be if we prayed before we did anything? How different would your day be if you prayed first and then said, okay, God, you lead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. You prayed and said, Holy Spirit, put a guard over the door of my mouth. I'm not gonna speak unless you tell me to speak. Imagine the decisions you have to make. Like, can I just lovingly tell you if you'll pray and ask God what to do with your life, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And his plan and his purpose for your life is not going to pull you away from him. So if there's stuff in your life pulling you away from God, that's not from God. Well, I have a decision to make. You know, and if I make this decision, I can't serve at church. I can't be faithful at church. I won't have as much time with my family. And, and my relationship with God might begin to slip away. Friend, that's not God telling you to make that decision. If you'll ask God, he'll show you the decision that keeps you right where he wants you to be. What about a relationship? They're just so cute. I just love them so much. What would happen in your relationship if you prayed before you entered that relationship? Well, but I'm already there. Okay, so pray now and say, God, do I stay in this relationship? Because we're not married yet. And for some, you're like, well, it's too late. We're married. 
Pray. And ask God to change you. Listen. A relationship you think is sent from God that pulls you away from God is not sent from God. God's not going to send you somebody who will pull you away from him. He's going to send you somebody who will pursue him just as passionately as you want to pursue him. And if you're not passionately pursuing God, God might send somebody to you who's on fire for him, and they're going to pull you along and get you on fire for him too. Let's talk about finances real quick. Because if we prayed about our finances, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. Now, don't misunderstand. You can pray, and you can put God first in your finances, and you can still have difficulty. But in that difficulty, you'll know that God's still in control. And there are some financial decisions we make that we didn't ask God first. We ask him after the fact. God, should I have done this? He's like, nope, but you did it. So now, now what are we going to do? And God's like, I'm going to provide. I'm going to take care of you. But I want you to honor me in your finances. Well, God, but if I honor you, I can't spend all this extra money on me. And God says, exactly, honor me and don't worry about you. I know we just got started and I'm already all up in your business, but imagine how different our life would be if we prayed before we did anything. I understand the value and the importance of prayer. And one thing I've noticed no matter how much I pray, I never feel like it's enough. Like I can, I can have prayed for an hour and I'm like, oh, I should have prayed longer. And what I've discovered is the enemy wants to distract us from praying and crying out to God. But the writer of Hebrews, listen to what the writer of Hebrews said. The writer of Hebrews said this in chapter four, verse six. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I may feel like I haven't prayed enough, but I have learned when I approach the throne of grace with confidence, God, I know you're my help. I know your mercy is available and your grace is there. I can with confidence walk away knowing I've received exactly what I needed in that moment. And if there's a longing in my heart, if there's a hunger in my heart to pray more, I can stop and pray more. Because listen, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have the privilege to step into the very presence of a holy God and we can cry out to him for help and he promises to help us. So Jonah, in verse two, said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Jonah is proof to us that when we think we're so far from God and God can't hear us, God hears us. See, Jonah is saying, from the point at which I was the furthest from God, from the place where I was miserable, and think about Jonah, he has nothing to bargain with. He ran from God. He's in rebellion. He's in the pit of a great fish. There's nothing to trade God with. God, if you get me out of here, I don't know. Just get me out of here. He's, he's losing hope. He's helpless. He's desperate. He's afraid. He's hurting. And he says, in the midst of my pain, I cried out to God. Here's what we learned from Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. God gave Jonah a taste of the horrors of hell. See, he said, from the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. Another translation says, um, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. In the Old Testament, Sheol is the place of the dead. And Jonah's like, I was as good as dead. I was so far away from God, I ran in my rebellion. But even in my pit, I cried out to God and he heard me. Maybe this is you. Maybe you're in the middle of a pit. Maybe you consider your marriage a pit. Listen, it takes three people to have a healthy marriage. A man, a woman, and Jesus. You take Jesus out of a marriage and it's not going to be healthy. You take Jesus out of a relationship and you're going to feel like you're in a pit. Maybe the job that you have, you feel like you're in a pit. Maybe there's an addiction or a habit that's controlling your life. Maybe you're carrying some hurts that you weren't intended to carry. Maybe your heart has become so hardened because like Jonah, you're living in rebellion and running from God. And Jonah said, from the depths of my inward pit, I called out to God and he heard me. This week I got in, I got in my vehicle and the radio was on and there was some song and I don't even know what the song was or who was singing it. I can't give credit where credit is due, but I heard these lyrics in this song. From the wreckage of my choices, I called out to God. 
And I said, that's it. That's what Jonah's saying. From the wreckage of my choices, he's in the belly of this great fish, and he's saying, God, I made the wrong choice because now I'm in the belly of this fish, and I'm in the place of the dead, and if you don't intervene, I'm going to die, and I'm going to regret my choices. He called out to God from the deepest, darkest place, and God answered. I'm pretty sure wherever you are today is not the belly of a great fish. You feel like you're too far from God, so he can't hear you, but God hears you. The psalmist said this in Psalm 34, verse 4, I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles, for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. You know what we learn from Jonah 2, verse 2, and from Psalm 34? When I needed God most but deserved him least, he answered me. So many times we won't cry out to God because the devil's like, well, what are you crying out to God for? You haven't been talking to him. You've left him on a shelf. You've been doing your own thing. God's not going to listen to you. Turn around and say, shut up, devil. I'm going to cry out to God because he's going to hear me. How do you know God's going to hear you? Because the word says, because Jonah cried out, the psalmist cried out. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, verse 8, even when I'm in the deepest darkness, I can't get away from your presence because you are there. What I want you to hear and understand this morning is you can't get away from God. You can run as far as you want to run, but you can't get away from God. And what Jonah is saying, are you getting this? Jonah is saying, I was as good as dead. I was completely in my own power, helpless. I had nothing to bargain with, but God, even though I didn't deserve his love and mercy, was still on the throne. God was still hearing me. Did you hear what I said? Even when we don't deserve God's love and mercy, God's still on the throne and God hears us when we pray to him. Now think about this for a moment. At at any point in this account, God could have done anything. God could have delivered Jonah. God could have calmed the storm, but he didn't. But God did still do a miracle. You see, God was actively working even though Jonah was in pain. God was working even when Jonah couldn't see it. And maybe in your life you feel like you're in pain. Maybe you're identifying with Jonah, you're in a pit, and you're thinking, is God even working? God's working even when you can't see it. Even when you don't feel him, he's working. Even when in your rebellion you've run as far as you can, God's still working. Why would God keep working in my rebellion? Because of his relentless love for us. Because God's like, they're running, they don't understand, I'm going to pursue them, and I'm working, and they're going to see my glory through all of this. How exactly is God working? Let's reflect. In in chapter 1, verse 1, God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, nope, not it. God said, I need somebody to go to Nineveh. Those people are evil. I need somebody to preach repentance to them. And Jonah says, not it. Send somebody else, Lord. In fact, I got to go. And he left, and he ran. And God's in heaven saying, that boy, he doesn't understand. I got a plan, and I'm going to use him for my glory. And he thinks he can run away. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's just send a storm chase after old Jonah. So God sends a storm. Listen to me. God sent the storm to get Jonah's attention. And the scripture says that Jonah went down under the boat and took a nap. He said, I'm not listening La, 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 I don't hear a storm. I'm not listening anymore. No, I'm not going to go, God. So God says, all right, I got to do something else. So he sends a captain. And the captain walks in and says, son, what are you doing sleeping? Get up and pray to your God. In the midst of a storm, God sent a captain to wake Jonah up to say, hey, pay attention. Something's going on here. Jonah said, yeah, I'm running from God. This storm's because of me, man. And the sailor's like, Lord, why are we here in this boat? Why'd you put Jonah in our boat? What did we ever do to you to be in a boat in a storm? We're going to die because he's running from you. God, we're not running from you. Jonah said, I'll tell you what, guys, just throw me in the ocean. Dude, we don't want to do that. We're not going to sin against God by throwing you into the ocean, making you fish food. And finally they said, you know what? Sorry, dude. God, please forgive us. We're going to throw him over. And they threw him overboard. 
Do you understand that when the sailors threw Jonah overboard, that was still God working? Because Jonah's in a situation running from God, and he keeps going from bad to worse to, what's the next word? I don't know, worser? That's not even a word. But things just keep getting bad. Things become overwhelming. And the scripture said that when Jonah was thrown overboard, the sea grew calm, and the sailors began to cry out to the Lord God. But God was still working because God sent a great fish. See, God has been working since verse 1. In Jonah 1, 1, God's plan was for someone to go to Nineveh and preach repentance, and he chose Jonah. And Jonah said, don't choose me, God, I ain't going. And God said, yeah, you're going to go. I'm going to get you there. I'm going to get you there. So many times in our lives, we ask God to do things, and when God doesn't do what we think he ought to do, we, we get mad. Or we freak out. Oh! or whatever it is you do when God's when you say God would you do this and God says no we're going to do something else listen we have to learn to let God work we have to learn to watch God work look back at all that God's done in your life and realize God is simply taking you through the next phase in your journey to what he's called you to be in every situation God is working and God as he's working he will lead us he will teach us he will redirect us he will guide us he will heal us he will correct us he will convict us. He will do everything in his power to get us to his ultimate will for our life. Are you being obedient to the will of God for your life? I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer, so it must not be his will. Maybe you prayed and you didn't do what God told you to do. People come to me all the time and they're like, Pastor, how do I know the will of God? How do I know God's will for my life? What's God's will for me? And here's my answer. I don't know. Ask God. Ask God. How do I discover the will of God? I got two verses for you real quick. The first one, I'm not even gonna read the whole verse, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two, from an older translation of the NIV, NIV 84, says this, fix your eyes on Jesus. You wanna know the will of God for your life? You focus your eyes on Jesus. You look at Jesus and follow where Jesus leads and do what Jesus tells you to do and go where Jesus tells you to go and don't do anything Jesus doesn't tell you to do. Just keep looking at Jesus. A squirrel, no, don't look at the squirrels, look at Jesus. But Lord, what are they doing? doesn't matter what they're doing. Look at Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Be so focused on Jesus that when he walks straight, you walk straight. And when he goes right, you go right. And when he goes left, you go left. Because Jesus is not going to go back. He's going to keep going forward. And he wants to lead you. But you can't follow Jesus if you don't have your eyes fixed on him. The second verse is this. Jesus said this in John 15, 5. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You want to know the will of God? Fix your eyes on Jesus and get as close to him as you can. Get so connected to Jesus that nothing can separate you. And I believe this with all my heart. When we focus our eyes on Jesus and we're connected to him, we let him lead. And one day we, look, we stop and we look around and we're like, how did I get here? And God says, I brought you here. This was my plan. This was my purpose. But I didn't even see us coming here. I know, because you had your eyes fixed on Jesus, because you were connected to Jesus and you let him lead. We want to figure out all the details, and we want everything to be all hunky-dory and unicorns and butterflies and just feel-good moments, but life's not all feel-good moments. There are some difficulties. There are some storms, and sometimes God sends a storm to get our attention. But no matter if God sent the storm or your storms because your rebellion, God is working. Jonah prayed, and God heard him when he prayed. See, God's got Jonah's attention. Can I lovingly tell you, don't, don't put yourself in the position that God has to send something drastic to get your attention. Just stay connected to Jesus. But God's got Jonah's attention. And now we can learn through Jonah's prayer a couple of lessons. First of all, this, 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 is this lesson here. Never forget the but God moments. See, Jonah 2, verse 3, Jonah prayed, You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Verse 6, To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. See that in verse 6 at the end? He said, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. You know what Jonah's saying? My life was out of control. I was as good as dead. But God intervened. 
But God intervened. In the pit of the great fish, Jonah realized and understood, there's nothing I can do to get out of here. I need God to intervene. I need a but God moment. You feel like your life's spinning out of control? Remember the but God moments. There are always but God moments. Some of my favorite in scripture, read the story of Joseph, read it later, but Joseph 45, chapter 45, verse six, Joseph is talking to his brothers who sold him into slavery. And he said, for two years now, there's been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. Verse seven, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Have you considered that where you are today was a but God moment, that you didn't plan to be here today, but God had a plan to get you here today because God's doing something you can't see? God is working even though you can't see him working. Read on in the story of Joseph. I love it. Genesis 50, 20. Joseph tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended for it to accomplish what is now being done to saving them in their lives. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What's your but God moment? We all have one very similar but God moment. Paul writes about it in Romans 5, and he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest but God moment in your life is when Jesus died for your sins. You didn't deserve it. You can't earn it. He just loves you because you're his. But God demonstrated his love while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One of my favorite but God moments in scripture, I won't read the whole thing, but 1 Corinthians 1, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. There are moments in our life that we think, how's God gonna get glory out of this? And God goes, that's me. I'm gonna choose something foolish to shame those who are wise. 1 Corinthians 3, verse six, Paul said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Nobody notices when I serve. Why are you serving? We don't serve to get credit. We serve so God gets the glory. And here in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. God invites us to partner with him, and he says, there's a but God moment. Would you do something for me that you may not get credit for, but I'll keep record and I'll get the glory for it, and I'll reward you for that. What's your but God moment? This room is filled of people who have story after story after story of but God, but God. I was addicted. My life was was going the wrong direction and my life was going to end in a very bad way, but God intervened and brought salvation to my life. My marriage was gone. My marriage was in trouble, but God at the right moment came and intervened and healed our marriage. Financially, I was ruined. I had made a mess of my finances, but God provided supernaturally and all of a sudden there was enough and God made a way. My health was deteriorating. Doctors were calling and doctors were saying this and doctors were saying that and and all the news the doctors gave me, it wasn't good news, but God had a different plan and God intervened in my life. And we can go on and on and on about people in this room that have stories that are but God moments. When you pray, God hears you when you pray. From the pit, you can cry out to God and he'll help you remember the but God moments. I love Matthew 19, 26, where Jesus taught it. He said, with God, all things are possible. You may be in a situation right now that feels impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? When Jonah was at the point where it looked like he would never survive, where all hope seemed lost, that was a but God moment. For Jonah, from the depths of the pit of the fish's stomach, he calls out to the God of heaven, and the God of heaven hears Jonah. One more lesson I want you to see from the story of Jonah in chapter two is this. Remember God and unblock the funnel of God's grace and mercy. Remember God and unblock the funnel of grace and mercy. Verse seven, Jonah said, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. Today, you're going to remember God. Maybe you're thinking, well, I didn't know I forgot him, but you did. You see, things go well in our life, and we set God on the shelf. God, I know right where you are, and I don't need you right now. Things are going well, and I'm going to do life my way. When you leave God on the shelf, you forgot God. Remember God. When you set God on the shelf, you don't pray for days because God's over there, and I don't need God right now. Everything's going okay. 
But then one day we realize I've been living without the power of God. And it's funny how we don't remember the power of God, how we don't remember God until we find ourselves in a pit somewhere. Think about this. When we forget God, we choose to live without God's power. Verse 8, Jonah says this. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. I like the older version in NIV 84. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Those who cling to the stupid things of this world, things that don't matter, are unable to receive the grace and the mercy of God. Those who have idols in life. What were Jonah's idols? Jonah had the idol of prejudice. God said, go to Nineveh. And he goes, those people? Those people don't deserve your love, God. If you find yourself seeing those people, you have an idol of prejudice. You need to go to God and have him change your heart about those people. Because we're all the children of God. We can't be prejudiced toward anybody. God hates prejudice. Jonah had the idol of self. I heard you, God, but I don't care. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to go there. God, I know you're calling me, but it's not what I wanted to do. I'm not going to answer that call because I don't want to do that. What's the idol of self for you? Maybe for you, it's your image. Well, if I do that, how's it going to appear? How am I going to look? Maybe for you, it's a relationship. Well, if I answer that call, what about this relationship? Maybe for you, it's materialism. I just need more stuff. So God, I can't do that because I need more stuff. Maybe for you, it's success or maybe it's habits. Maybe it's hurts. Listen, what Jonah's teaching us is when we cling to worthless idols, we cannot receive the grace of God. We forfeit God's grace. We forfeit the pursuing love of God when we cling to worthless idols. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 3, verse 22, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Are you clinging to worthless idols? Are you putting your hope into things that have become idols and cause you to miss the grace of God? Verse 9, Jonah says, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Here in verse 9, this is what Jonah's saying. God, you know what? I was wrong. I should have never got on this boat. I should have never sailed the other direction. I should have gone to Nineveh. And so God, I tell you what. You get me out of the belly of this fish, and I'll go where you want me to go. And I'll say what you want me to say. And I'll do what you want me to do. God, give me another chance. Give me a second chance, and I'll be the man for you. I'll be your spokesperson to Nineveh. And God said, all right, you know what? I was waiting for you to say that. Now I'm going to intervene. What have you vowed to God? What have you told God? God, I'll do this for you. Has God laid something on your heart? You told him you'd do something? And t- well, today's your day to make good on what you promised to the Lord. Notice the end of verse 9. Jonah makes a statement at the end of verse 9 that brings everything home. He said, salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. In the middle of the belly of this great fish, Jonah is as far from God as he's ever been, and he realizes, if God doesn't save me, I'm not going to be saved. Salvation is from the Lord. Salvation's from God, it's not from you. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so no one can boast. Salvation comes from the Lord. You can't bring anything to it. You can't do anything for salvation except receive the grace and mercy of God. The only reasonable response to God is, God, here's my life. Take it, I surrender to you, because salvation comes from the Lord. Now think about Jonah. God said, Jonah, I want you to go. And Jonah said, Lord, I'm not going to go. So he ran. And so God said, all right, I'm going to let him run, but I'm sending a storm, I'm sending a captain, I'm sending sailors, and I'm sending a great fish. And in the belly of this great fish, Jonah's going to begin to see what I was doing to him. And God let Jonah run, and he ran as far as he could from God, because you can't get any further from God than in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a great fish. And God said, son, do I have your attention now? Hey, you listening to me? Do I have your attention? Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. That's what I wanted. 
You see, you don't deserve my mercy. You don't deserve my grace. But right here in the belly of this great fish, I heard you, and I'm coming to you, and you can't get away from me. And the, the mercy you're receiving and the grace you're receiving, I need you to go to Nineveh because they need the same mercy and grace. Will you go to Nineveh? Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Salvation is from the Lord. God needed Jonah to come to a place to experience repentance and the mercy and the grace of God so that he can now be equipped to go preach repentance to Nineveh. So wait, Jonah wasn't prepared before? Oh, he could have gone before, but he was stubborn. So God said, all right, come on, I'm going to teach you a lesson. In the most promising scripture in chapter 2, the most grace-filled scripture in chapter 2 is verse 10. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. God said, all right, he's had enough. Fish, spit him out. And God could have said, fish, drop him off at the nearest port. And he didn't. We don't even know where he was. Where was this fish hanging out? We don't even know. God just said, all right. He learned his lesson. Spit him out. He's got to get to Nineveh. How far away was he? We don't know. But Jonah says, it don't matter how far it is. It don't matter how much it costs. I'm going to go because God gave me a second chance. Listen, whether you're on top of the world or in the depths of a pit, surrounded by the wreckage of your choices, when you cry out to God, he will answer you. God's looking for men and women who will walk in obedience and do what he's asking us to do, no matter what the cost, no matter who the people are, he wants us to obey. We're not gonna obey if we don't pray. But you can still pray and disobey. Prayer is hearing from God. Living out our faith is walking in obedience to what God told us to do. Stand with me this morning. I want to pray over you. God, I thank you this morning for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your sons and daughters who are here today. We've had a wonderful time worshiping, lifting our voices, and now worshiping through the word. Thank you for this occurrence in the life of Jonah, for the lessons we can learn here. Holy Spirit, touch each heart today and do a work only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. This moment's between you and Jesus. And I wonder if you're here today and you would just simply say, Pastor, today I realize I need salvation. I've been trying to earn salvation. I've been trying to be good enough or religious enough, but I realize salvation is only found in the Lord. And today I need to surrender my heart to Jesus. I need salvation. If that's you, slip up your hand. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm going to wait just a moment. Maybe you're here this morning. And you say, Pastor, today I realize there's some idols that are keeping me from God's grace and mercy. And today I need to let go of some idols. I need to let go of some things that I've been clinging to that are keeping me from the fullness of God's grace and God's mercy. If that's you, slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. Last question. Maybe you're here today. Say, Pastor, today I need to remember God. I need to remember what he did so I can have hope that he'll intervene again. I need to remember the but God moments. If that's you, slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Father, today I thank you for the work you're doing in hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, complete what you started today. In Jesus' name. I, I didn't see hands that were raised for salvation, but God, you know our hearts. Holy Spirit, you, you know the deep parts of us. And maybe today there's somebody here that you're tugging at their heart and you're, you're asking them to just to come and to kneel in repentance to you and just to receive salvation, just to reconfirm their salvation, to make a new commitment to Jesus. Lord, forgive us for the times that we try to earn salvation and we try to be good enough. Forgive us for the times we forget that salvation is only found through the blood of Jesus, through the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. It's the free gift of God, not by works, lest none of us should boast. Holy Spirit, thank you for the heart you're touching today that there are several that said, I need to let go of some idols. There's some things in my life that I've been clinging to and I realize, like Jonah said in verse eight, I'm clinging to worthless idols. And by clinging to these worthless idols, I'm forfeiting the grace of God. And I don't want to forfeit the grace and mercy of God, so I'm going to let go. I'm going to lay these idols down before God today. Lord, bring freedom today. Bring deliverance today. Bring victory today in Jesus' holy name. And God, there were many hands that were raised. People just said, I need to remember the but God moments. I need to remember what God has done so that I can have hope 
to know that he'll intervene again. Because right now, I feel a little bit distanced from God. Right now, I'm in a pit. Right now, I'm in a storm. And I'm not sure, is God even paying attention? But, but Jonah cried out to God, and God heard him when he cried out. And I'm crying out now, God, I need you to intervene. And Lord, as I'm crying out to you for intervention, bring to my remembrance the but God moments when you did it before. Because God, if you did it before, I know that you'll do it again. Because you're a faithful God. God, we need you. We need you now more than ever. God, touch each heart in each life today. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.